All right, everybody. Um, welcome to our second session for PDH Day today. And for those who uh, maybe weren't uh, in, in attendance for the first one, um, just a couple quick ground rules. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in in the chat box, and I will go ahead and relay them at the appropriate time. Um, and beyond that, uh, I'd like to introduce Betty Jean Jordan, our Executive Director for the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for being at our first ever virtual PDH Day. We had a good first session, and I'm looking forward to carrying forward the momentum on our uh, subsequent sessions here. So a few things. First of all, if you're not already a GSPE, NSPE member, we invite you to join. And you can do that easily by going to NSPE.org. And you'll see a Join Now button at the upper right hand of that screen. So uh, do that and join us for other good things that we do. Uh, today's sessions are all one hour. So we've, we've built in a 30 minute buffer between each session. So we might go a few minutes over on any given session, but don't be concerned about that. Um, remember to get your uh, renew your PE license by December 31st. Just put that reminder out there. Um, I will be mailing PDH certificates to everybody, uh, emailing them uh, early next week. And other than that, we, we learned on the first session, if you do not have a YouTube account, if you're not logged in, if you would like to put something in the chat, uh, you have to be logged in to do that. So if you are not logged in, you can just email me your comment and I will post it on your behalf if needed. And with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker who is Roger Granis. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Betty Jean. And let's give a, a, a round of applause to Betty Jean who's done an awesome job putting this day together. It's a lot of work and she's, she's, it's going great. But I can tell at the end of the day at five when, when everything's done and completed and you're all happy, it's gonna be a, a, a nice happy evening. For Betty Jean. Let's also thank Steve uh, in the booth uh, doing all the all the technical work. He's like a TV producer back there, uh, <laughs> complete with a, a microphone that's uh, used on movie sets. So Steve, Steve's aces. Hey, uh, so I'm Roger. I wanted to start with uh, a story that I hadn't planned to tell, uh, but the point of the story is one of the keys to presenting well is to always know what came before you. And I think one of the best things to do in a day like today, let's say you're one of many presenters, is to is to watch the presenter before you. Of course, presenting formally can can uh, cause some nervousness, so that's one of the ways to help you get in the room mentally and stay calm. It also helps you uh, find something from that previous presentation that you might use to link to your talk. So I did watch Stephanie's presentation on passing along institutional knowledge through coaching, storytelling, and mentoring. By the way, it was a really good presentation. She's a great presenter. She had a great background, type of virtual background you might wanna have. She had a plant and a gray screen. Uh, she also talked about uh, storytelling, which we're gonna emphasize in this, in this presentation. Uh, and she also, um, she had some great visuals. I actually got a screenshot of that. When we get to this part of the talk, where we share visuals, I'll actually reference uh, her great work. Uh, the story I want to tell, though, is this. Um, I, uh, my father is an electrical engineer. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. And uh, he was always tinkering uh, with all kinds of gadgets uh, down in the basement. I had a more creative, well, he's creative in his own way. I had a, a less linear uh, creative streak. So I actually uh, started out uh, pursuing uh, some theater and comedy. I was a disc jockey for a while. And there's my dad there uh, in San Francisco many years ago having lunch before I moved from there to Connecticut. But during my creative phase, I, living in San Francisco, uh, studied some theater at San Francisco State. I, I tried my hand at stand-up comedy. Uh, I was very nervous. Uh, and, and my biggest night, uh, one of my friends said, oh, Granis, you got to go and enter the San Francisco comedy competition. And I said, okay, fine. I, I got up the nerve and went, but he had invited like 20 of my closest friends. My fiance came and that just uh, added to the pressure. So I was so nervous when the comedian before me, this is tying into watching the speaker before you. When I, I, I was so nervous, I went out into the alley 
uh, bef- while this other comedian before me was was presenting, was speaking, and to calm my nerves and kind of get in the zone. And then when I came in and I tried joke number one, no laugh. Joke number two, absolutely nothing. Joke number three, dead. I, I, I thought, is there anybody here? And I remember in the back of the room looking at the bar, I could they, they had a mirror behind the bar. So I'd actually see myself way in the back of the room in the mirror. I thought, this is, this is the worst day of my life. And then I, I, you know, I kind of bombed. I did bomb. And I sat down with all my friends and, and my fiance said, oh gosh, did you see that guy before you? I'm like, no, I was, I was out in the alley. She said he was, he, he got the audience really nervous. He came out in a bathrobe, he took it off and he was dressed as a bumblebee. And uh, the aud- and, he, and he kind of wigged out and ranted. And so had I seen that, A, I would have known what the room was like. I would have felt the, you know, the, the, the moving from laughter to this, this fear and uh, eye rolling. And I could have made fun of the bumblebee guy. So it's really important to know what came before you. And if you're the only presenter, part of preparation is knowing what the audience knows already. All right. So there's there's point number one, tying it into a story. And remember, Stephanie, if you watched the pre uh, the prior program this morning, she talked about how important storytelling is. And we'll talk more about that in depth later. All right. So let's get back to the scheduled programming. Uh, there's my dad, Roland Granis. Uh, uh, double, uh, electrical engineer, went to UC Berkeley. Great guy. God rest his soul. Uh, really terrific guy. Boy Scout leader, Eagle Scout, uh, just like me and my son. Um, but I mentioned earlier that he uh, he loved to tinker in the basement. And he would make these gadgets that would go up uh, to service power lines, get get power from the substation out to the uh, the outlets in people's houses and, and in businesses and whatnot. And uh, so I understand engineers, I understand the thinking, uh, how we love to tinker, how things need to be precise, the love of graph paper and having everything lined up in an order. Uh, of course, I was not like that at all. But uh, so here, here's the deal. So growing up in California, we would take vacations. Uh, we would go to some of the beautiful places, Yosemite, wine country, uh, Carmel. And my dad, this is this is the honest truth. My dad would pull the station wagon over and he had this big telephoto lens. Now, most people would be taking pictures of mountains, flowers, the ocean. My dad was taking pictures of telephone poles to see his great inventions up there uh, in the, the Sacramento Valley. So that was my father's. My way of saying, I understand engineers. I empathize. I grew up with one. And I have spent my career uh, using all this creative background, radio, theater, a little bit of failed comedy, and and taking this creative streak and coupling it with engineers. So I have spent my, once I got a real job, my career helping technical experts sound good, make their point clearly, and be more persuasive. This is what I love to do. Uh, it, it's what I'm. It's what I'm here for. So my parents said, you know, you should get a real job. So l- let me just give you a little background because it's going to link to how to help you today take these nuggets of, you know, my many years of work, uh, synthesize down to help you. So my first job was in sales in Berkeley, California. I went from theater to Berkeley. So equally crazy people. <laughs> and I worked for a guy named Adam Osborne. You're probably too young to know who he is. This is in the early 80s. He actually invented the first portable computer. It weighed 22 pounds. It came, it came complete with uh, all of the, the program uh, software and the applications. Uh, and Adam Osborne. I actually worked for his publishing company uh, where we he wrote and his staff wrote computer books to help, again, technical content, make it easy and simple for lay people to understand, which is a lot of times what you have to do. I went from there and moved to Connecticut to work in sales for a company called Gartner. If you don't know it, it's a highly regarded technical research and consulting company uh, that helps uh, technology folks, chief information officers and others uh, understand technology and make the best decisions. 
So what I've done is, uh, oh, and then I also ran Gartner sales training for, for five years. Uh, during my time, we, we grew revenues from 32 million to 850 million. Uh, and then I hosted a podcast for nine years there. Again, helping technical experts sound good, be persuasive and speak clearly. So I did that at Gartner and now I do it on my own at Granis Group. Uh, and that's what we do. We, we help people like you through uh, workshops, coaching and keynotes. All right, so enough about, about that. Let's get into the meat of this thing. All right, this is what I observe, have observed over 30 plus years in working with, with engineers and other technical folks. Common presentation mistakes. Number one is too much information, okay? We want to take all that cool knowledge we have and pack it in. Uh, number two, it's not targeted to a specific audience, so it's, it might be perfect content for Bob, <clears throat> but it's not for Betty G. Uh, the content lacks a cohesive structure and a memorable concept. Uh, I see a lot of a lot of engineers fill those uh, slides, the PowerPoint slides or keynotes, with lots of lots of words, kind of like this slide that I'm holding up now. Uh, the delivery, uh, you know, maybe a little monotone, a little bit inflexible. So one of the things is we want to do when presenting is, and this ties back to what I said earlier about listening to the person before you. They may have covered content that you had planned to deliver. So in your mind, you want to be flexible and maybe dial that content back or pay courtesy and respect to that person and say, hey, the prior presenters, in this case, Stephanie, talked a lot about storytelling. So I don't need to go into depth on how important it is she covered that i'll cover it for those of you who may have missed it but i don't want to say things that the audience already knows so let's do a quick uh, uh, chat question i'm going to ask you as you look at that list of the biggest present mis presentation mistakes uh, i've seen which one do you typically make and the reason i'm asking this is a we want to get some participation but b i want you to to not just listen to me today hopefully awake, uh, but also think about, well, gee, what is Roger saying that I can apply to myself right now? What is the mistake I'm making that I want to commit to fixing? And that might help us uh, you know, connect better and, and maybe you pay, pay close attention. All right, so Steve's gonna help us out with the chat function. He's going to uh, monitor that. And I think I might be able to see that as well, maybe in the comments. Box. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Good morning, people are saying. Yes. Uh, okay. Lovick, don't be a bumblebee. Wow, you know, that's... Now, here's an interesting thing. One of the things we're going to talk about later is having a memorable concept. So, Lovick just said to me, why don't I use that phrase, don't be a bumblebee? Wow. It's like Stephanie used an example earlier. She was describing a podcast about bowling balls and you don't want to give people too many ideas to think about because they can only hold so many ideas or like bowling balls. If you give them too many, they're going to fall on the floor and, uh, or on the ground and, and you know, dent it or break it. Right. Don't be a bumblebee. I'm actually going to write that down. <laughs> that could be the title of a speech. It could be the title of a book. You see how that resonates? That's a, it's a clever uh, phrase that's memorable and specific. All right, um, too much information. A lot of people saying that. Abe, small print in many words. Jim, busy slides that presenters read to the audience. Right, yes, big mistake. And look, we all do that. I have shared with you my most embarrassing moment. Well, there are a couple that were equal to that. <laughs> Failed comedy night, but great. Kevin, lacking a cohesive structure. Great. Too much information, yet aware of not being readable. Yeah, and we're going to talk about all that stuff. Dry delivery. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about three things. Number one is how to target your audience, the importance of doing that and how to do that. Number two, crafting your content. That's the key to engaging the audience and overcoming nervousness. It's not, part of it's the 
you know, relaxing ahead of time and all that. But if you've got really good content that you've worked on and it's clear and concise and compelling, that is the secret sauce right there to getting your message across. And, and we're all still going to be nervous, but, but managing and uh, using that nervousness to, to guide you through rather than uh, you know, overcome uh, or overwhelm you. And then thirdly, we'll talk about sharpening your visuals. And I've got a, an extra component specifically about in a virtual world, but all of the previous content, targeting your audience, crafting and sharpening your visuals, all of these concepts are equally important, if not more so in a virtual world because we're, we've got distractions, and we've got, we could be multitasking. So uh, we're not gonna change the approach to presenting in a virtual world in terms of the, the three things. Another key point is I pick three because there's magic in using just having three key points. If you've got seven points, people might forget. So what you want to do is either eliminate some or make those sub bullets of your other three key points. Again, it's like the bowling balls. You can kind of hold three, but you put that fourth one on there, you know, the audience has got big problems. So I want to think, I want you to think about not only the challenge you want to, uh, to work on today, but how you want to apply this to a specific presentation that you maybe have to give soon or that you typically give so that you're not only thinking about, all right, I want to be, I want to have a better structure, but I want to do it with uh, an upcoming proposal that I'm creating for a new city roundabout that we're, we're bidding on or whatever it is you're doing. All right, targeting your audience. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, I live in uh, Connecticut, about an hour from New York City. Uh, and you never know it. It's uh, it, we live in a lake community. It's a small lake. There are about uh, 80 houses around it that were built as cabins in the 1930s. So it's kind of remote. Um, be a good place to film a horror, a horror movie. You know, it's kind of dark and quiet at night. Uh, we don't have big lots, but ours is fenced in. That's my backyard there because we have a dog, and we like to let the dog run around. So about 15 years ago, back in the day of flip phones, remember those? Uh, I had that in my pocket. I was about to fly to Chicago, so I loaded up. I had, you know, my good clothes on and all that. I'm walking from the house across the backyard to the barn where we've got the cars. So you've got to walk kind of from the right around the tree into the garage and then go out the other side onto the onto the other street. And again, this is a remote area. Uh, this is this is 4:30 in the morning. It was like a quarter moon, so it was kind of a kind of like a horror film lighting, kind of a purpley color. And there was a mist coming down. And you know how when something's different in your neighborhood or your house uh, or uh, something, you it, it stands out. Let's say a neighbor painted their house, uh, used to be blue, now it's yellow. Boom, that thing jumps out. So that same phenomenon, and there's got to be a name for it. I don't know what it is. But I'm walking through the yard sort of asleep, going up tree, uh, other tree, round in the corner. Whoa! an object between me and the door. And I'm like, that's a person, I'm scared, I'm gonna die. So I, I, I help! There was no response. And I all, all I can think of was Spock. So I pulled out my flip phone and hell up, I said, hold it right there. Now this thing didn't move. And I thought, well, maybe I'm asleep and it's just a shadow. So I, I got a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And it was a woman soaking wet shivering 4.30 in the morning. And in that moment, when I stopped thinking about myself and I saw the world through her eyes, her point of view, I realized she was the victim, not me. She had been involved in a domestic dispute several blocks away, had run through, found my gate and hid behind it. So, so as, as I was dialing 911, and the police came on, I, I was helping her, not calling for to rescue me. So what's the point of that story? The point is, we engine, everybody, we're locked inside our own world. Number one is to look outside ourselves and find out what's important through to the other person. Really think about it. Henry Ford said, if there's any secret to, to success, it lies in the ability to get other people's point of view and see things from their angle as well as your own.
Hey, Roger. So that's really important. We want to get outside of our head and think, what do these people feel? What prior knowledge do they have? What is it they need from me? And again, you want to hone it down. So it's three bowling balls. Don't give them 12. What are the three key things that will have the greatest impact for this audience right now? And strip everything else out. Stephanie also talked about recording uh, training sessions. And she said afterwards, we edit it down. So I hosted a podcast for nine years. I recorded these Gartner technical experts for an hour each. We whittled it down to the best seven to 12 minutes. I sat in the editing booth. Each section we took out, the remaining content got exponentially better. So it's not what you put, more, it's not what you, we don't want to put more and more in. We want to strip things out so that the precious gems that are left really shine brightly. Roger, Steve had asked so if the... I, I, do, I work with a lot of uh, technical experts, product managers and engineers to launch new products. And one of the problems we have, uh, they have, honestly, is, is with the sales training element. So to launch a new product, they've got to create content for the CEO, a business plan. Suppliers, here's all the, the, here's all the components that we need to put in it, uh, the, the specs and whatnot. Prospects, help with the marketing information. Customers, might be a user guide. How do you fix this thing if it breaks? And then the last train on the car is the caboose. That's the sales team. So by the time a new product manager starts developing and thinking about sales training, they're tired. Uh, they don't, they maybe haven't been in sales. So what do they do? They dust off a PowerPoint that was used for typically the pro of typically a user guide, like for the customers, how to use the new product. Well, that is a little piece of what the salespeople need. They need to know things like, why is this uh, product important? Why was it developed? What's the customer need? What probing questions should I ask on sales calls? So again, uh, this is a costly mistake. Uh, it, it, sales train, new products fail 50% uh, of the time and greater. So, and it's partly due to this lack of analyzing the audience and knowing what we need to give them. Typically what we see, and, and this is true for engineers in a lot of presentation, we give a lot of details. Maybe it's product details, maybe it's details about uh, uh, the, the, the strength uh, of, of, the, uh, of the design and the specs. And now certain members of the audience, uh, or certain audiences absolutely have to know that but not every audience. So in the case of the salespeople, we don't want them feeling like something's burning and I think it's my brain. Roger, are you able I to hear like me? That. No, we want to teach how to sell in this particular case. So again, analyze the audience. What are the three things that are going to make the greatest impact? Now, we don't only want to think about our immediate audience. We want to give the audience a soundbite, a couple of key points, that will lodge in their heads so that when their boss or the people that they've got to persuade say, hey, Julie, what do you think about uh, that proposal from XYZ Corporation? Loved it. You know what I you know what their deal is? No, don't be a bumblebee or whatever it is. Give the audience something that will stick in their brain so that it's repeatable to somebody else because we're all under pressure to not only just make good decisions for ourselves, but we've got to persuade other people. And that's where we want to have a message really crisp and tight so that they can repeat it to the people they've got to persuade. A little more details on analyzing the audience. I, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but we want to think about how senior they are, uh, what's their role, how much knowledge do they have of the topic. Uh, good thing to think about is, how receptive are they? Is there any resistance? Is there any, are there any political landmines I might uh, need to be aware of? And of course, motivation. People uh, use logic a lot in, in making buying choices, but ultimately there's an emotional decision in there. Do they like you? Uh, do they, uh, have you touched on their emotional drivers? Uh, and again, we could, we could do a whole session on that. We'll get into some of it, 
uh, a little bit. Okay, let's go into another key point. And when I talk to and train and speak to engineers and other technical experts, this is one of the components that they appreciate a lot. Now, you may have been through some training about four communication styles. One of the popular ones is called DISC, D-I-S-C. There are many others like it. Uh, it's all the same thing. About four communication styles and how to uh, shape your message so that you're appealing to each of those four different styles. Certainly this works well in one-on-one -on -one communications, but there's some tips in here too when you're presenting to a small or larger group. So we're gonna do a little audience participation here. Uh, number one is we're gonna match this, the person on the left in the green frame with one of the people over on the right, one of the three people, and we're gonna match their communication style. Now I know some of the people pictured up here might elicit a strong emotional uh, response, positive or negative, or somewhere on that scale. We've got to strip all of that away. You know, the people we need to present to, we don't, we don't love all of them. So you may have that response to these people as well. I understand that. Uh, so what we want to do is focus on just this criteria, their communication style, however you define that. So let's take Donald Trump and again, take out all the preconceived notions, good or bad. Think about just his communication style. Any, any comments? Uh, actually, you know, I'm going to keep this moving uh, just so we make sure we have time to cover everything. So what do you notice about him? I'll think about it. Well, bullet points, uh, gets to the point pretty quickly. Uh, he's, he's pretty fast paced, right? And abrupt. Is he a people person? Yeah, sometimes in a large group. Um, you might argue that he's more focused on the task than he is uh, being nurturing and caring about people's feelings. All right, so as you think about those criteria, which person over on the right most has those communication uh, 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 traits? Who is uh, task-focused and bullet point oriented? You're probably thinking Hillary Clinton, and you are absolutely right. It's kind of ironic that they were running uh, running against each other four years ago. All right, let's think about Mr. Rogers. What do you think about his? Again, observable communication traits and his style. Okay, is he task-focused or people-focused? More people-focused. He's nurturing. He's caring about people. Uh, what's his style? Is he fast-paced or slow-paced? He is slower paced, right? So which person over on the right is slower paced and people focused? Well, you could say Robin Williams and Oprah Winfrey are people focused and they are. The difference is their pace is a little bit faster. Mr. Rogers, slow, quiet, nurturing. Now engineers sometimes are slow, quiet, introverted. But the difference is, again, I'm overgeneralizing and oversimplifying. They, we engineers, tend to be a little more task focused. So it's easy to distinguish between a fast paced and a slow paced person. The nuance here that we want to pick up on is looking at your audience, the key person you're trying to persuade. Are they people focused or are they task focused? And we'll talk about how to shape your communication to match those different styles in a minute. All right, let's go to Obama. Now, when he's speaking to a large group, uh, he's people focused, he's high, high paced, fast paced, but when he's one-on-one, -on -one, he's being interviewed on 60 Minutes, he's slow, methodical. He thinks through every answer before it comes out of his mouth. So he is slow paced and task focused. Again, not to say he's not people focused at all, he certainly is. That's his ultimate goal, but his communication style is more task focused. And by the way, each of these uh, styles is in every person, but it's a matter of degrees. We want to find out their primary communication style. And then finally, we've got Robin Williams, fast paced, people focused. Who over on the right is most like him? Why, by golly, it's 
Mother Teresa. I see somebody saying none of them. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna keep moving. Um, so, but but thank you for that. Um, so again, this is how we're gonna now look at our primary person that we're trying to influence and determine: are they fast or slow paced? Are they people or task focused? So we've got these four different styles. We've got D. This is D. If we start at the upper left, disc D. I, S, C. These are the four communication styles. Dominance, direct, results, driven, firm. The influencers like Robin Williams, outgoing, enthusiastic, optimistic, lively. They're more fluid. They're more fluid and flowing. Unlike my dad, who was more like the lower left, the conscientiousness, very analytical, he's very reserved, super precise. Uh, he built a replica of the Victorian house he grew up in in San Francisco in San Francisco in his retirement he spent nine years building the replica of the house he grew up in precise methodical systematic the steadiness folks is the s uh, even tempered accommodating patient and very tactical so just think about for yourself for a moment who are you which one is your primary communication style again each of these styles is in every person, but if you think about it as four different uh, bars, like on a graph, there's one that's that's more uh, st more dominant, not to be confused with dominance, but more uh, prominent. Okay, so there we go. All righty. So which one do you think about that? Because you're going to think about addressing your blind spot. This is one of the key takeaways. We as people tend to follow the golden rule says, deliver our presentations to other people as we would want them delivered to us. Okay, we want to break that thinking. The number one takeaway I want you to think about from this session is, if you only present in your own style, you are going to leave out the person in the diagonal opposite corner that have nothing in common with you in terms of that communication style. So let's take the example of the dominance, strong-willed, tweeting all night, I'm gonna get this wall built, versus an S, a Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is not gonna respond well to that abrupt, direct behavior. So, we, so the dominant person has got to, the dominance person has got to Slow the pace down. Ask about the family. Ask what's important to them. And if you do have to present a difficult message, reassure to them that everything's going to be fine. Relationships will stay intact. Similarly, uh, an S person would have to pick up the pace, be a little less touchy-feely. Okay? Similarly with the C's and the I's. Uh, the C's, one of the biggest issues I see is You've got to loosen up, flex, pick up the pace. Let's let's not talk about all the bits and the bites and the strength of the aluminum. Let's talk about possibilities, how this skyscraper is going to look great and your name is going to be on it. You've got to play that role. It's hard to believe, but you've got to flex your style to match those others. We could do a whole day on just that training. All right, but we're going to keep moving. Think about your blind spot for just a moment and the changes you need to make to better engage that communication style. We're gonna do a little practice with that right now. So let's imagine we're bidding on a new terminal for an airport, okay? And we've got four people in, uh, in the room that we've gotta persuade. And we wanna make sure part of our presentation is gonna match and make each of those four people happy, make them feel whole inside. All right, so let's start with the Ds. What do we say they want? They want bullet points and bottom line, right? So take a second and type in your comments in the chat about how you would, what key point or two would you make to somebody like a Donald Trump who wants bullets and bottom lines, doesn't want to be bored with all the details, don't want to hear about all the coffee shops and how happy everyone's going to be inside. They want this thing done, they want it fast, and they want it cost effective. Right, so nobody's typing in, that's okay. Yeah, uh, Roger, can you hear me? So that's what they want to hear. It's going to cost this, 
that will be done by this date. And our track record is ABC. That's all they want to hear. Let's go to the influencers, the, the, uh, the Robin Williams and the Oprah Winfrey. How would you describe the same airport terminal to them, the, your proposal to them? Well, it's going to look great. Uh, people are going to love it. It's going to get high ratings. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of restaurants and bars inside where people can hang out and feel comfortable and less frustrated about waiting for uh, delayed flights. So talk about all that fun and activity. And notice how your voice inflections and your energy level is going to change. How about for the S's? Now, my daughter, I just dropped her off uh, at JFK Airport yesterday to fly back to Europe. She's got her one-year-old baby, our grandson. So how would you describe this new terminal to, to my daughter if she's in the audience? You know, she's got a little baby. She's, you know, flying alone. Her husband uh, was working. So you'd want to talk about maybe the changing rooms. Maybe there's a yoga room. Uh, maybe there's a, uh, a private family area. Uh, where it's quieter and you can spend some quiet, private time alone. And again, change the tone, dial it down. Now, how about for C's? Again, not to overgeneralize, but that's where many, not all, of our engineers fall. All right, engineers, you know yourselves. What do you want? Lots of details. Uh, what planning went into this? What was your track record with the other airport terminal? What mistakes have you found? How did you overcome them? What is the strength of the bolts that you'll be putting in? Tell me about the various subcontractors you're, you're recommending, and so on and so on and so on. You want to know planning. You want to know details. You don't want to hear any flake talk about, oh, it's going to look great. Trust me, beautiful. No, that will turn C's off. Okay, hopefully you're getting enough on this, and or if you've had some of this training before, reinforcing some of those key points uh, that you already know. I have taught and taken this training many times over the years, always get more out of it. And when I'm asking the different communication styles to report to me, what do you like and dislike about your style? And then we ask a question, what's the best way to persuade you how to structure your content? It's always the same all over, all over the world. Bullets, fun, lively, nurturing, quiet, lots of details. Show me that you're prepared. All right, so that wraps up targeting your audience. Let's look now at how to shape your content. Again, this is key. It, 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 and, and if you get just a couple of new ideas on how to better structure your content, that will make a huge difference. Again, you want to target your audience, communicate to the right kind of communication style. And now we're going to look at, all right, so you've got, imagine you've got a big, table in front of you, you you know, you've written everything down on some cards, or you've got a software package to do that. You're looking at, okay, which bowling ball do I want to bring into this? And, and here are, and you've narrowed it down to, let's say, three key points. Now you're going to take those three points and make them sing. You're going to be uh, producing a Broadway show. You're going to present to this audience. You want it to resonate, and you want it to get great reviews, and get you what you need. All right, number one, we talked about this earlier, one memorable message. Again, we're trying to get a, maybe a phrase that pays or a key concept that sticks in the audience's mind. Verbal Velcro. Don't be a bumblebee. Don't have more than three bowling balls. Those two things would stick, I think, really well. Steve Jobs, his phrase was a thousand songs in your pocket when he launched the I, whatever it's called, the I, the little music box. All right, maybe a phrase that pays, uh, cohesive structure, campaign title. So here's, here's some examples of phrases that pay. Mask up America, drive sober or get pulled over. You drive, you text, you pay. Uh, in Connecticut, uh, we don't manage our finances very well. Uh, maybe I need to move. But uh, it's our, I think we're rated 49 out of 50 in terms of the way the government is managing the finances. And so the new governor said, oh, I know, I got an idea. Let's just uh, put tolls in on the roads. Well, there's, those tolls were taken out about 30 years ago. And, and so a campaign, a groundswell was created by uh, 
citizens to eliminate or to not to not let this vote for polls vote for tolls go through. So they created this campaign title, "Vote for Tolls, Lose at the Polls." It worked. Uh, the governor withdrew the proposal. We're not getting any tolls. Uh, and then, if you remember the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, Johnny Cochran, the uh, defense lawyer, said, "If it doesn't fit, you must acquit," referring to the glove. That worked. It worked. Um, I admire a lot of keynote speakers. Here are three. Here are three of their phrases that they use. Make your bed, get gutsy, nice bike. I could elaborate on those, but I want to be sensitive to your time. Uh, but again, e these are highly paid superstars on the, the top corporate and association uh, stages around the world, and they know uh, what they're doing. They've got phrases that pays. Here's one that I was playing around with for, uh, for, this, for this talk. And uh, so again, you would go through the same process. It takes a lot of work, but sometimes the idea will come from the audience. Like, don't be a bumblebee. Thank you. Uh, Lubbock, I'm gonna give you credit for that brother. Uh, all right, so here's the essence of, of this talk, the one we're giving now. Confidence comes from good content. I said that earlier. If you've got a good message that's well-crafted, then confidence will come and so will the results. I just say then, little typo there. And so will the results. So I said, all right, how do we boil this down? Well-crafted content leads to confidence and results. Okay, a lot better. Will that stick? Mm, not sure. Lovick, I hope you're listening because I'm, I'm counting on you to make this even better, bro. <laughs> Craft good content for confidence and contracts. So, that, so I'm seeing this pattern of a lot of words that start with C's. Okay, okay. Carefully crafted content equals confidence and contracts. Yeah, the word contracts not quite right. So it's it's getting somebody to say yes. So it's sort of a contract, but not. So still working on it. So I said, all right, what if we just make it a bunch of C's? Carefully crafted content equals C squared. Confidence and contracts. Lubbock, weigh in, my friend. I need to make this one better. I'm counting on you. All right, but you get the idea. It's a lot of work. You got to work on it. Some of the best ideas come from the audience. So go out and present. Maybe ask them, hey, what would you, how would you, how would you summarize this talk? Maybe a cohesive structure, uh, 30, 30, 30. So when I was at Gartner, uh, the company went public. And the CEO at the time, Manny Fernandez, did a roadshow uh, to all of the financial institutions around the world, uh, hoping that they would get their clients to invest, buy stock in Gartner. And he, his phrase that pays was a cohesive structure. 30, 30, 30. Look, the power of threes, a repeated number, very powerful. I said, Manny, how'd you come up with this? He said, I just made it up. And it was, we will have 30% uh, uh, top line growth. We'll have a 30% improvement in our customer retention and a 30% improvement in our EB, EBITDA, which is a financial phrase. And so 30, 30, 30. Again, that's powerful. Uh, I was a Boy Scout leader here in, in Connecticut and we wanted to increase enrollment. So I needed a concept. I needed a year long plan that all of the volunteers could rally around. Uh, and I came up with three R's, recruit, retain, record. That was the, the framework, the structure for our campaign. And there is a, in our troop, because we uh, were near New York City, so we've got some, some you know, high level executives around. I'm not one of them, <laughs> but they're around. So a CEO of a very large company was in the room, uh, highly respected, great guy, very generous was in the room. I said, our goal this year is three things, recruit, retain, record. Now this guy's heard everything. He actually got out a piece of paper and wrote it down. So if a CEO of a big company that's seen everything writes it down, you, you may be onto something. Here's another one. A, this is, I think this is a, an acrostic. Engineers always simplify, yes. Again, some kind of a structure to help your audience remember. And it will help you get excited to overcome that nervousness. So you're not just doing a lot of blah, blah, blah. It's focused around one central point 
that you keep coming back to and reinforcing. Uh, you can have a campaign title, Operation Dynamo. That was Dunkirk, if you saw that movie a couple years ago. Operation Overlord, that was the campaign title for D-Day. Operation Leapfrog, when I launched the podcast at Gartner, that's what I called it. We want to leap ahead. Operation Leapfrog, again, this will get your audience excited, get them motivated, get them rallying behind this, this, this campaign that you're leading. Okay, we talked earlier, I mentioned uh, the power of three. Use it, use it, use it. This is simple. Just boil your points down to three key points, the three bowling balls. Okay, there's probably something related to bumblebees that I could tie into this. They need a nest. They need the flowers. They need the whatever they need. See, that would tie it all together in a common theme. Uh, three little pigs, three blind mice, three musketeers. Yeah, we used uh, those first two examples already. Acknowledge, honor, connect. So one of my favorite keynote speakers, Mark Sharon Brock, the nice bike guy, those are his three key points that he makes in this. It's almost a one-man show. It's so good. And he's been working and refining this for, for 15 years. It gets better and better and better. But he's got those three key points. Uh, this was in our local paper a little while ago. There is, this is completely unrelated to Gartner and the example I gave, 30, 30, 30. So here's the reporter saying, hey, this is what we need. So he came up with the same thing on his own. Stephanie, in our prior talk about passing on wisdom from uh, you know, the wise folks at our organizations, how do we pass that along in the organization? One of her ways was to tell stories. Bravo, use stories. Uh, there have been some studies done that show that when a person is listening to a story, more parts of the brain light up than any other form of communication. Stories engage. Uh, they're memorable. They stick. She, remember that story she told about uh, the handprints in the concrete? See, that stuck with me. Of all the things she said in her presentation, powerful. Not only because it's an image, it's a story. It touched the emotions. And listen to this, did it have anything to do with the, with the person who was using that story at, at work? It had nothing to do with work. She took a story from her personal life, well, she was reporting on somebody else telling the story. Uh, this, the presenter was using a story from her personal life to make a point in a business application that had nothing to do with creating sidewalks. The story I told about my backyard, hello, that was a personal story. Uh, they not only stick, uh, they provide relief, they help bring facts to life, they make you human. Especially now in this virtual world, we are starved for human connection. So telling personal stories are key. Um, Stephanie also said, I'm gonna skip to some of the details. I think she also said, stories have to have a point. Absolutely true. One of my mentors in the speaking world, Glenna Salisbury, has this formula, point, story, application. So we don't want to just tell stories. And one of the worst things we can do is try to be funny and tell a funny story, maybe at the beginning, that has nothing to do with the, the, the message we're trying to, to get across. Okay, it might be an icebreaker. Much better to have the story have a point that ties into the message that you need to give. So one way of doing it is to make the point. So in my case with the backyard, uh, I would say one of the key things we need to do is, uh, is see the audience's point of view. Let me tell a story. Boom, now I'm telling the story. And then I said the point of the story again is always see the other person's point of view. Then you want to apply it to the audience's, uh, the audience's situation. You might say something like, in this case, how, in this case, it's really important that we understand the needs of the, of the drivers who will be using this roundabout. And in our research, we found blah, 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 blah. So again, if you're, if you're trying to win a deal, maybe tell a story where you had to understand the other person's point of view, and then, then report on what the users of this 
airport, roundabout, water, uh, sewage treatment plant? What are the needs of the people who will be using it? All righty. And stories are everywhere. The sidewalk story, my backyard, uh, my father, the engineer, taking pictures of telephone poles. They're everywhere. The key is to write them down as soon as you think about them and maybe keep uh, keep a little file. I keep a, a, a carry around these little notebooks. I've got like a hundred of them. Uh, just, just jot it down because uh, middle of the night, write it down. Uh, you think you might remember later, you'll probably forget. So I, I would recommend uh, keeping a file. All righty. All right, facts, data, and statistics. Again, we're, we're shaping our content. Uh, we probably, as engineers, use these a lot. Don't stop using them. Make sure they're focused on what the audience needs to hear. You might have different slices of the presentation for different audiences. The CEO might need a short couple of bullets. The, uh, the, the technical experts you're working with will need to know all of those details that you would provide so that make sure the bridge is gonna not collapse and whatnot. Uh, make clear connections. Uh, stress the new and unusual. You wanna, you wanna tell the audience what this means. So don't just give abstract concepts, but help them understand by turning them, you know, make a point to, to, so that it's concrete for them. Always cite the source. Uh, and avoid data overload. So data, statistics, facts, great. I would recommend, uh, as I said, don't make the whole presentation filled with those. Intersperse them with a little story, uh, a, little, a little anecdote, uh, uh, one of these other techniques. Maybe use a comparison or, or an analogy, that's another technique. Uh, boxes are like chocolates. Uh, you never know what you're gonna get. Uh, I use this in speaking. I think I mentioned this earlier. Nerves, like, like in, in speaking, we all still get nervous. It's normal. So don't try to fight it, accept it, and then use the nerves like ocean waves. Just ride them like a surfer and they will propel you forward during your presentation. Uh, here's another one. Uh, we're, we're problem solvers as engineers. We wanna persuade people. So one of the techniques is to create a picture of a brighter tomorrow. What will the world look like after your new sewage treatment plant is put in, your new roundabout is put in, uh, the new cell tower is put up? Just give them a glimpse of what life will be like later. That gets them to see beyond the details and, and engages the emotions. So here's, here's another quick story. Um, so when I was single, I lived, uh, and I lived in San Francisco, I moved across the Bay to Oakland and I was looking at condos, uh, with a realtor and she used this technique of painting a vision of a brighter tomorrow for Roger, who, whose love life, eh, not so good at the time. So she took me out on the balcony and she said, oh, and we were overlooking the Oakland Rose Garden. And she, she pointed to the, this is a replica of that building, but it looked just like this. She pointed to that empty space at the bottom, uh, at the, I'm sorry, at the far end of the screen. And she said, can't you just see a Weber barbecue here and a table for two? Suddenly I had this picture of my, my dating life, improving my romance life, catapulting to levels never before seen in my sorry life. So it's just a simple way of painting a vision of a brighter tomorrow. Certainly Dr. Martin Luther King and his great, I have a dream speech, did the same thing. I uh, picture one day when man will be free and so on and so forth. All right, um, I wanna mention too, when you're painting a picture of, a, of the future, you can paint the picture of the positives. Life will be good. Uh, you're gonna have a great uh, steak dinner with a, uh, you know, a date, uh, uh, all mankind will be equal and loving, or you could uh, take the negative out. So people are twice as motivated to remove a problem as they are to gain a positive advantage. So you could frame the same comment of the future by removing the negative. So for example, in the case of my my uh, barbecue, she, she would say, can't you just picture the barbecue and the table for two? 
and then your loneliness will be over. Now, a realtor probably wouldn't want to say that to somebody because you're saying, hey, you're a lonely loser. No, we don't want to do that. But you could, let's say, um, let's take a, the example of a roundabout. So you could say it both ways. So uh, can't you, you're talking to the, the people, the, the city of uh, Richmond, Virginia, as an example, or Atlanta. Uh, can't you just picture, this is the positive, can't you just picture that smooth flow of traffic even during rush hour? Or removing the negative, you could say, can't you just picture at last no more traffic jams, no more horns honking, and no more complaints coming into your office every day? Again, that's eliminating the negative. You could actually say it both ways. Something to think about. And then finally, don't forget to appeal to emotion. Uh, if you've studied Aristotle, you know that there are three modes of persuasion. Aristotle said that to persuade other people, we need to be credible in the eyes of the audience. That's ethos, that's your background. So you wanna talk about your credentials, make sure they know that. Logos, we certainly want to appeal to, to logic and we as engineers are very good at that thing we want to think about, though, is pathos, appealing to emotion. C.S. Lewis said, more truth is comprehended through, through the emotions than the intellect. Uh, there's an old saying in the sales world, which I come from, people buy with emotion and then justify their decisions with logic. So look for that emotional appeal. Uh, so don't just show them the design. And it depends on the audience. Some some engine some people you're talking to get really uh, positive emotions when you go through all the details. Absolutely no question. It's just that not everyone has the same emotional response. So you want to again analyze their style, uh, package your information appropriately, and then appeal to that person's or that audience's emotions. So don't just talk about the specs of the car. Talk about how safe they're going to feel, how uh, the, the family is going to enjoy some vacation time together. Whatever it is, you've got to do your own analysis on that on that particular audience. Okay. One of the keys I mentioned earlier is just having variety. Take a look at your key points. Analyze your audience. Look at these seven modes of persuasion and try to bring in a couple styles that you haven't used before. It, audiences love variety. Uh, again, um, don't pack more in. You want to find the gems and, and eliminate the rest. I love this quote from Alfred Hitchcock. Drama is life with the dull bits cut out. That's what I did producing the podcast. Hour of content, find the gems, edit those together, delete everything else. You want to do the same thing in your talks. All right, finally, fart sharpen your visuals. Uh, this is what we see a lot, lots of word on the slides. What we want to do is move those words, which is really your talk track, get them off the page, move them into the notes section. That way you can still send your PowerPoint slides to whoever. They can read the details in the notes section, but you don't want to have those on your slides. So this is an, actually an engineering company I work with. So we, here's one way we, we could revise it. We took, uh, we put a picture in with some bullets. We had just the picture as an example. Uh, let's let's take the example of the moonshot back in uh, when it was first announced in 1961. People still talk about the moonshot speech. Again, that stuck with people. It's a powerful speech. He had a mission. He had a statement. This is John F. Kennedy. By the end of this decade, we will fly man to the moon and return them home safely. So this was his talk. Now the talk, he didn't use slides. So by the way, you don't have to always use slides. You can always turn the projector off and turn it back on between slides as well. So if John F. Kennedy had a PowerPoint slide, he could have written his words on the screen like that. He could have created bullets. He could have had a picture with bullets. He could have had just the picture. Now. Did you feel, I'm going a little fast here, but look at the emotional response between this slide and this one. Do you feel the difference? This slide, it's like an eye, eye exam. Which, which, which lens is better? Bullets 
no bullets. This just is like looking at a piece of art, clean, no clutter. It takes the words out. So consider using pictures only sometimes. Or he could have had the picture with the bullets. This is back to the Kennedy speech. If he wanted to make it funny, cow jumping over the cow jumping over the moon. He was working with a, an engineering firm, and they were doing some work with petrochemical plants. And they're talking about we can't have uh, hazardous gases floating around because they will explode. And this is what this this is what this actually this is about a quarter of the words that he had proposed presenting. It was all text. And I said, look, so you're telling me the, the petrochemical plant would blow up if some stray gases get, uh, if a spark gets in there? And he said, yeah. So I said, hey, why don't we just show a picture of the plant blowing up? So he said, oh, that's a good idea. So we did that. Again, here's another busy slide. Uh, you can see there are four natu natural components of this. Let's break it that into four slides. And uh, uh, you know, eliminate the words and so forth. So too much information on one slide. This might be a great handout. If you need to share this level of detail with the audience, give them the handout like this. They can follow along. But this uh, make this multiple slides up on the screen. The rule of thumb is if you need bullets is five by five. So have no more than five bullets up on the screen. And each of those bullets should have no more than five words. Okay, so the five by five rule. Some say it should be three by three, but you get the point. Have some sort of a framework where it's just not all words. Uh, if you've got to show a, a detailed process, you can use a zoom in approach where you show the big picture, the, the full map, and then you highlight the section you're next gonna talk about. And then you take that section and you make a slide out of that with the one, two, three bullet points over on the right. Start with the big, orient them with a highlight, and then go to that slide. And then you would go back to the big picture for the next point and so forth. Okay, if you've got to show a detailed slide, this might be a handout the audience is looking at. Uh, at least bring up a circle. I'm now gonna talk about the section over on the right, and then you might even take that section, make a, an individual slide out of it. Uh, we sometimes don't have the time, do the best you can. We, we certainly want to move away from all slides and reading to some sort of breakdown where there's some pictures and some variety in bullet points. Again, another way of highlighting. Okay, so I got a screenshot of Stephanie presenting last hour. Uh, these are awesome visuals. Look at this, a nice title up the top, a picture, uh, there's a grayed out background, and four bullets, okay? Uh, and she used the term accidental collisions. It's got a nice uh, kind of a almost a Chevron graphic at the bottom. This is the model that you wanna strive for. Bravo, Stephanie, nice job. Uh, here's some uh, other models. Again, we're not graphics artists, uh, and I'm sure Stephanie's company's got a team or a, a, a resource uh, communications firm they work with to, to create something like this. But, but move that direction move that direction. Another example of a, a great slide. Let's just uh, wrap up with some, some tips for presenting virtually. Uh, we wanna create a presentation space. We probably least often think about acoustics. Uh, and when I was talking to Steve yesterday, he's running the booth in the back today. I said, hey, how's my acoustics? He goes, you know, do you have a uh, do you have one of those things you got with your headphones, the ear pods? I go, yeah. He said, better to get the microphone closer to your mouth because the camera's here, the microphone's there. Good, but this is a lot better. So you want to think about acoustics. I do hear a lot of people presenting, and it, it's they're too far, and it's really echoey, and it's the le the last thing we think about. We first often think about okay, so our hair and all that. We think about our background, okay. So just don't have a mess. Um, Stephanie had a great background. Gray screen and a plant. I've got the books. Uh, lighting is another key thing. But I would think, again, put that thought into acoustics because you may not be thinking about it. And also your, ba also your background. You don't need to be Hollywood producers. Honestly, one of the greatest parts about COVID is that 
we're seeing people be real. Their, their dogs are walking in, their, their dogs are barking. Uh, you know, maybe they've got a baseball bat in the background. Be yourself, don't overthink the, the background, but think about the acoustics. Play to the camera, you wanna look into the camera uh, as much as you can, that people feel the eye contact. Oh, the camera should also be at eye level, you know, not, not too above and not, you know, not too far down and that kind of thing. Again, something to think about. Uh, engage the audience, uh, ask polling questions. We've done a little bit of that. There's a lot of chat going on. Uh, call people by name. I mentioned Lovett a couple of times. Uh, Lovett, and I'm still waiting for that phrase that pays, pal. Uh, <laughs> um, ask them to apply. So we did that a little bit in this talk. Uh, how will you use this content in your presentation? Uh, maybe some collaboration tools. Uh, there are ways of having people circle. Uh, you can uh, you know, get people put up hearts or applause meters. So any, any sort of audience engagement is, is key. And absolutely super important, even more so where there are, we could be multitasking during your presentation your presentations, simplify the content. It's gotta to, got to be clear, concise, and compelling. Each extra hour you put into it, it gets exponentially better. The great writers, like novelists, creative writers in the world, uh, one of the best is James Michener. And he said, I'm not a great writer, I'm a great rewriter. So you start with a sloppy copy, you go back, you fine tune, you tweak, you move things around and maybe run it by a couple people. They might come up with, certainly give you feedback, but come up with a phrase that pays or a cohesive structure that you may not see that easily. And when presenting virtually, you wanna keep your energy up. It's, uh, it's really important because we're competing with, with television uh, when we present, frankly. All right, any questions? Any questions? Get in the chat while you're doing that. Um, like to invite you to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I do make this available to engineering group. If you would like to chat for 20 or 30 minutes about a presentation you're working on or a, a concept you wanna run by me, uh, I find a lot of people like to do this. Happy to do it as a gift to you. And uh, just send me an email to roger at granisgroup.com. And just in the subject line, mention NSPE Georgia, free consultation. I also have a laminated tip card, happy to mail you one of those if you like. Uh, free, again, a thank you for being here. Uh, just email me your mailing address and I will mail that out. All right, I am actually printing a new batch of those. They've been so popular uh, that I it might be next week before I drop it in the mail. Thanks. And gosh, yes. I would love to, Steve. I don't know if. Let's uh, see. Are you able to hear me got now? Any questions? Can I hear? We can I hear you? Yeah. Do you hear me? It you know, like I'm actually not hearing you. Huh? Do you have your volume up? What, I, I cannot hear you. Actually, let me let me pull my. I'm, I apologize if you were trying to interject questions earlier on. Yeah. Hmm. Do you hear me any better now? Steve? Yep. There we go. I'll just go ahead. Okay. All right. You hear me now? I do. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. We don't know what happened. Um, I did try one earlier because I think maybe in part because uh, folks knew you weren't able to hear me. Uh, they may not have come out with as many questions, but there was one um, that kind of may have already been answered. Uh, but Steve was asking, does the rule of three apply to technical training? Right. Great question, Steve. Um, what I would recommend is, uh, is is break sections down into three chunks. So let's say you've got 12 technical components that you've got to cover. Excuse me one second. You know that? Uh, yeah, one of the things in virtual training is to turn off your phone. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, back to you. Yeah. Uh, try to use the concept of free within the, the component. So let's say you've got 12 sections and each section has seven things. 
can't, you're not going to use it every time, but try to break those things down into, into simpler, into simpler components. Stephen Covey, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, I think we're more forgiving with training where there are, you are going to cover more than three things. So use it when you can, but it's not a rigid rule. I think it's especially important when you're doing live, live presentations, or if you've got a chunk of that training, here are the three keys we're going to cover in this next step, next section. Yeah, George Hadwin was kind of a, a, a amusing. Uh, he says, "Did the fiance who heard you bombed out uh, your bombed out comedy presentation marry you?" She did. She's uh, yeah, but there's a whole story with the previous fiance, which if you sign up for the consultation, <laughs> I've had uh, I've had my ups and downs as we all have, but yes, I I lucked out. And it, it, it's a great story, and it's, it continues with Grand Hill and that. So. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions from anybody? It's Anything even, you may have been thinking of that didn't yeah. get out there because of this? All right. I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Um, give people a, a chance to go ahead and uh, do that. I just want to remind folks. Uh, if you go to uh, YouTube, to our channel, G-S-P-E-N-G, so it's Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, so that's how we got the, the G-S-P-E-N-G. Uh, YouTube wouldn't let us do just G-S-P-E. It was too short. But if you go there and subscribe to the channel and click the notification icon, uh, you'll be notified. We do uh, typically have monthly uh, presentations as well um, from the Atlanta Metro chapter. So there's lots of good content out there. Uh, so go ahead and subscribe. And I'm not seeing any other questions yet. Yeah, if there, just one final question. If there is a, I guess you're putting those in there. Um, if, if there's a key, because I'm always tinkering with this and trying to make it super relevant. If you've got any comments, things you'd like to see more of or less of, please let me know via chat. Um, I'd also love to know, What's the one key takeaway that you can use right now? Uh, it's kind of an end of training uh, technique, of course. We want you to take what you've heard and, and use it. And to, for your own sake, please type that in the chat, but it will also help me know what's working the best here. Yeah, go ahead, folks. What do you think your takeaway was, your key yeah. takeaway? I think they're all thinking. Yeah. 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 Uh, Steve says the five by five. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Yeah. Anybody and else? To you, Steve, am I going to be able to read the chat comments here somehow it, later? Yes. Yeah. If you go back afterwards, the, uh, the chat, uh, the comments will actually play back in sync with the video. Okay. Okay. So I have to watch. Got it. Um, let's see. Yeah. Abe just says, great session and good tips for presentation. Um, let's see. Betty Jean said, the four different communication styles. I'll keep that in mind for various audiences. Yeah, thank you, Betty Jean. Uh, <laughs> Ashley says, uh, let's see. No, she's just saying she agrees with Betty Jean. Um, and then uh, let's see. And Steve also adds in the five tips for presentations. Uh, and here's a question uh, MR Chasman is asking What is tip card? Oh, a tip card is a, uh, it's, it's a key, key, it's something I would mail you, you it by your desk. It's got the, the key points that I made, made in the presentation. So it's something I would mail to you. At the end of a workshop, I would give them out to people. So this is a way of doing it virtually. Yeah. Hopefully it makes sense. Yep. All right. That seems to be the end of it. So um, 
Yeah, so Roger, thank you very much. Uh, I, with the exception of the, the minor little uh, technical glitch, I think this uh, certainly was a great presentation. I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, oh, by the way, let's see, here's uh, Roger just came in with a, a last minute ad, uh, thinking about the four styles and segmenting the market. Right. You know, and one question that comes up often is, well, what if I have an audience and I don't know and I don't know the players? You want to touch on each of the four styles. That's the simple, short answer. What if you're presenting to an audience and you do know the players? You want to slant your presentation to the primary decision maker, but be sure to touch on the other four styles. So lean it a little bit towards, skew it a little bit toward that primary person. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the key influencer, the power person, uh, but be sure to uh, touch on the other ones. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, uh, again, thank you, Roger. Uh, this has been great and uh, very much appreciate your time. And uh, if you need anything, you've got my contact information. Uh, if you need to, if you have any trouble getting back into the your own presentation or anything like that, just feel free to let me know. That sounds great, Steve. Thanks. Right. The yep. Great job, and it's probably a glitch on my end. Sorry about that. Uh, Betty, no problem, Betty Jean. Thanks again for inviting me, and uh, thanks all for for being here. Yep. Thanks. You have a great day. You too. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody.